the Pages 2K network has been running in various forms for about 13 or 14 years. And, and it's really come together around trying to understand the climate of the past uh, 2000 years. Uh, it's currently in its third phase. Um, it had a couple of earlier phases. I guess phase one was really focused around regional groups and reconstructing temperature in, in regional groups. Uh, that morphed uh, in the second phase uh, to being a little bit more around databases, synthesizing all those regional group uh, data sets, looking a bit at the ocean um, and synthesizing ocean data records. Uh, and now we find ourselves in phase three, which began in 2017 uh, and really um, 2K has grown into a very large um, group of people and uh, I'll get on to how we sort of how it changed from there. So I just want to say too that I'm speaking today on behalf of the coordinator team, uh, all of the photos of everyone uh, in the in the corner there and a number of them are um, uh, coming along and, and listening in, which is great. So really the uh, I just got my floating controls in the way. There we go. Um, really, the goal, the overarching sort of aim of, of the 2K network is to reduce uncertainties and in interpretation of observations imprinted in paleoclimatic archives by environmental sensors. So it's around paleoclimate. And when we hit phase three, um, it became clear that there was lots of sub projects around. There was um, projects around uh, branching into hydrology and looking at oxygen isotopes and, uh, and rainfall and, and those kinds of, of areas. Um, there was branching around into uh, proxies, um, different types of proxies, reconstructing forcing. So, so instead of just having a temperature focus, it really expanded out. And really, um, we found that we would really look at three different main areas, those being, uh, and sort of illustrated here in, in this kind of triangle, we've got methods and uncertainty. So, so what is it there, um, what, are, where are the, what are our sources of errors? Um, oh, sorry, I just read out the wrong, um, wrong thing on the methods and uncertainty, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so the overarching goal is to study the climate of the past 2000 years. Um, yeah, so what are our methods and uncertainties in our in our proxy records? So it's really one one area of, of research. And then what do we know from from combining proxies and models? What can we learn um, about both systems and, and the climate system within that? And then what are our um, climate very what's our climate variability? What are our climate modes? Uh, what are the mechanisms driving climate of the last 2000 years? And that's really the third sphere. And um, we sort of represent that, I guess, with this, this triangle of these three um, areas. And then when it, within that, we have these sub projects that I mentioned. And of course, we've, we've got data stewardship going across as one of the um, pages integrated themes that um, Pages 2K has been involved with um, some things like the, the Pages 2K database and, and trying to make all these paleoclimate archives available for everybody to use. Um, so yeah, uh, so when we break it down into the projects, um, these, these top ones that I've list, listed here are really the ones that are active at the moment. Um, and they're the ones you're gonna hear about um, uh, after I speak. Um, so the first three are looking at um, the North Atlantic region um, in the top one using, these, using annually resolved archives. Um, Paul Butler is gonna tell us a little bit about that. Um, we're going to look at uh, um, climb arc um, data, uh, looking at um, high resolution climate archives within archaeology and documentary evidence, um, multi cron looking at multi decadal variability. Um, and I've got to say, I almost titled this slide the acronym um, decoder because because um, we all have acronyms, which is uh, Nice for a shorthand, but uh, for, for those um, within and, and working a little bit more closely, but obviously can be a little bit of a barrier to, to people from the outside, not, not knowing what all these different things are. 
We have the Coral Hydro 2K program, looking at really tropical climate and tropical corals uh, and their temperature and the hydrology in the tropical regions. ISO 2K, which um, have just, uh, you know, been pulling together um, the, the, high, the isotope records from all sorts of different um, proxies from right across the globe. Um, that's been a really huge effort to, to bring all that data together. Um, Clive Ash, um, looking at climate variability in Antarctica and the Southern Hemisphere in the past 2000 years. And then Paleolink trying to um, look at um, the links between paleoclimate data and, and earth system models that have run um, paleoclimate simulations or past climate simulations. Um, there's a few um, projects that have, uh, you know, none of these projects had to run for the full three years of, of the 2K phase three. And for example, um, the, the global temperature um, field reconstruction and the global mean sea, um, global mean temperature reconstruction, these programs have, have published some, some very interesting and very high profile papers, but, but now are not um, continuing um, to, to be as active as they were. And that's just fine. It sort of depends on the, the groupings of people and, and, and the, the science questions that need to be answered and, and the motivation of, of everyone involved. Um, so I sort of, that's sort of a very quick summary. And then I just wanted to get to where we're at now because um, we are going to go through, we were scheduled to finish at the end of 2020, but we're now gonna go through to 2021 to thanks COVID. Um, and so we really uh, wanna have a big effort to look at what we're gonna do in, in the future. So what is the future of the 2K network? Uh, I think Sarah reminds me quite regularly that it's the longest running um, working group in pages. So, so maybe we're getting a bit long in the tooth and, and maybe it's time to, to pass on. And I should say for myself, um, I only became involved very late in, in phase one. So, uh, so I think we're, there's not that many of us who've been through the round for the whole time. Um, but yeah, we've got to look at what's next. And um, we've started this process. We had a, a survey that some of you may have seen and some of you may have completed. Um, that's, that's sort of the summary take home um, that we got out of that. Um, where people want us to go? Do people want us to just have a phase four or, or is there scope to actually take some of those um, projects and they can branch off into their own pages to pages working group in, in their own right? Or do we wanna find and come together again? Is there a unifying theme and question that we want to focus on? Um, so yeah, and, and the next step is what do you think? Um, we'd very much like to hear what you all say and, and your input. Um, we have a short survey that, that's follow up on this one, um, just, just refining some, because a lot of part of this survey was ideas for the next phase and what science questions and what um, connecting activities we could have and also some criticisms, that's fine. Maybe we weren't communicating as much as we should have been. Um, that's, we'll try to do our best. Um, and then the other avenue to get in touch is we're gonna, if you're participating in, in AGU, we're gonna have a poster um, and, uh, um, hopefully that gives us an opportunity to cross time zones and the like. Um, and then finally, uh, yeah, so just one more thing. So if you want to get involved in Pages 2K, um, even the projects that are going on at the moment, there's a couple of ways you can do that. So um, jump to the, um, the, the web page uh, and there's a few areas you can jump in and sign up to the uh, the, the mailing list um, and then also um, you can sign, we, we've got all the projects listed here and if you click on those, you can find out much more detail about each of the projects, a bit more detail about what's involved and importantly, the, the contact people if you wanna sign up. Uh, and then finally, I, I wanted an, a request, request from all of you. Um, you've requested us for an early career researcher as a liaison person um, and, and we would actually like to ask you if there's anyone out there that would be interested in helping us. We've, we've tried a few people and, and they haven't had the, the capacity to commit to, to helping out. Um, 
and what's what's in it for you to do this would be well our undying gratitude for keeping us linked with um, a whole bunch of enthusiastic ECRs and uh, you know we're really actually quite open to people who haven't been involved in pages 2k before but are interested so so um, I, I dobbed in Sarah to be the contact person for this but if you are interested do please get in contact. So I'll leave it there and then just hand over to, I think, Paul, you were going to um, go next. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's right. Thank you. Um, and I can just say that Paul Butler is um, representing the Oh, Paul, you'll probably introduce yourself anyway. I, I will, Helen. It won't start my video because of you, it says here. What or shall do I you not need even, Helen, shall I not even bother with the video for just share? Oh, I need to share my screen. Yes, mine should have stopped. Oh, sorry, Maybe no. just it's try it same. again, Paul. Yeah, okay. Okay, we can see you. That's good. Great. Can you see me in my yep. library come office? Um, okay, let me let me kick off with the uh, with the presentation. Um, where's my, uh, oh yeah. Okay, can you all see that? Yes, I can. And can you all hear me properly? Sounds good to me. You're not full screen, but that's okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's full screen on my screen, so. That's, um, yeah. Not to worry. Okay. So, yeah, so thanks for um, letting me do this. Um, I was a bit loath because we really have, a, I mean, these were great ideas that we had at, at uh, at the um, Pages Conference in 2017. I, I came up with these in collaboration with Karen Anderson, uh, who I think is here as well. Um, and um, uh, we were very enthusiastic at the time, but it has kind of dribbled on a bit. And although we've discussed having meetings and so on, it hasn't really taken off. But uh, I'm gonna tell you what it's about. And um, I think it's possibly not bad for the uh, ECRs to see this because it gives them a chance to get in on something which is really quite interesting um, on the ground floor. Um, uh, yeah, and another thing I was kind of looking for was a paid project to kind of piggy piggyback on and I think I found that as well. So I think we're in a position now to uh, kick off. I'm going to start with Climarch Date, which is a climate archaeology um, dating precision type of uh, um, project. Uh, come on then. So, can we move it on? Can we move it on? Oh, I need to start the slideshow. That's the point, isn't it? Slideshow. Okay. I hadn't even started the, the slideshow. Yeah. Um, so these three projects are based around these high resolution uh, marine archives that can be cross-dated like tree rings. So, you know, in terms of marine archives, we have sediment records, which are rather low resolution. Uh, we have marine coral records, which are high resolution, but can't be easily cross-dated and they're restricted to tropical region. We have terrestrial tree records, which are of course high resolution and can be extended through cross-dating back several thousand years. And then we have these marine bivalve records, um, which are a fairly new archive. I mean, they've been going for about 20 years now. Uh, but these are high resolution marine archives, cross-datable, and we can build extended chronologies with them, the longest being about 1,300 years. Some of these individual shells, these individual animals, can live up to 500 years, which is easily comparable with trees. So they're a great archive for the, uh, for the marine environment. Um, as an example of, a, of the 1,300 year chronology, and we can see that we have, uh, the, the, these are the full lifetimes of some of these shells, several of them more than 300 years, and that's really very useful. Um, so Climarch Date is the idea of trying to get better resolution in dating uh, using some of these archives. 
<laughs> so uh, when you're looking at um, archaeological sites, especially coastal sites, there are a number of problems relating to dating. Uh, if you don't have written records, it's a problem. If you have a, this, this marine radiocarbon reservoir effect, which is uh, caused by the fact that um, radiocarbon continues to date even when it's in the marine system. So a, uh, a marine art artifact can appear to be uh, much older than it actually is. Um, uh, and then, so the idea is to combine these state-of-the-art dating techniques to look precisely at the timing and sequence of cultural and environmental effects, uh, ev events, so that we can look at whether environment does drive cultural change or the extent may be to which human cultures have an effect on their surrounding environment. Um, so we can look at, uh, yeah, how communities have responded to climate environmental change, how they adapted to it, whether they influence it, and how they're affected by short-term or catastrophic events. And here are some examples of these uh, uh, cultural transitions. Um, and the, yeah, I'm going to move on fairly quickly because uh, um, we only have about six minutes. But this uh, we, we've got a new project now called Sea Change, which is about uh, uh, cultural transitions in the marine environments and their relationship to uh, climate and their relationship to marine biodiversity and ecosystem function. So we're looking at specifically about the cessation of cessation of whaling in Antarctica, the Viking settlement of Iceland in uh, AD 874, the Aboriginal to colonial transition in Australia, and um, the Mesolithic to Neolithic transition and industrial fishing in the North Sea. And we're really looking at how these changes might have affected uh, uh, marine ecosystems. So this is very close to what Tim Archdate is doing. So just quickly, in front of one of the other two um, projects, uh, I think we were looking now at an online meeting to discuss ways of integrating these data techniques and results from different projects. So people are already involved in, in projects that involve this, these kinds of um, relationships. I'm sure they'll be very interested in, in joining in and contributing uh, very specifically to this idea about the uh, this, this aspect of the, the dating of the different events. Uh, designing a database and looking for a volunteer to host it, who could be one of the ECRs looking at this, who is interested in getting involved with something like this. And, you know, I'm thinking about how this database should be structured on different spatial scales, regional to local and by broad time slices. But that's the way I'm thinking, and I think I'm going to get together a an online meeting after after this meeting. So I'm glad we had this to sort of kick me off and move me along. Now, Aramate is slightly different. It's not really the archeological site, but it is the relationship in the North Atlantic between, um, uh, between climate variables and uh, ecosystems. And it's based on a, a paper back, written back in 2014 by Brian Black, which related to the, um, uh, to the Pacific. And the idea is to look at uh, different um, eco records of ecosystem variability and see if they can be related together uh, as, as uh, common variables to look at the relationship with, um, with climate modes and ocean oceanographic modes in the North Atlantic. And so um, I'm probably running out of time now. So. But this is a, the kind of what we aim to do, identify suitable archives and sources of data and develop these reconstructions to provide insight into climate and ecosystem variability in the North Atlantic region over the past 2000 years. Uh, so again, I want to look at an online meeting of this group. Um, and then the idea that the climate oceanography side of this investigation could possibly be integrated with Multicron, which is the other one of these three uh, projects. Um, that one's led by Karen. I don't know if you want to say anything about this, Karen, do you? Well, I, I can if you want me to. Uh, the, um, the goal of uh, Multicron is to look at the multi variability that has in particular been established or 
shown to exist in, in modeling. And this multi-decade variability has then been linked to um, oscillations in the ocean and uh, large scale circulation patterns and atmospheric uh, dynamics, but also to, to external uh, climate forcing. So with a more, um, uh, the, the problem with modeling is that the, um, the instrumental time series is too short to actually give more, uh, to test this model to, to decide where this uh, variability comes from. So by using uh, annually dated stuff like bivalves and uh, coil in algae, uh, it's then uh, easier uh, to, um, um, yeah, to test the model performance over a sort of wider range of conditions. And, and, and in particular, a larger period of time than is possible with instrumental time records alone. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Um, I think I'd, I'd better stop there unless there are questions. Helen, do you want to ask questions about each presentation um, after it happens? We might end. save to the end because I'm mindful to make sure that everyone who's um, going to speak gets a chance. Um, but just keep an eye on the chat window. Um, I'll just note that yeah. Julian's um, put a, uh, a question in there. So we'll come back to that one. Okay. So we'll move on to Hussain Siani, who's going to talk about Coral Hydro 2K. Thank Hussain, are you there? Oh, there you are. Yep. Hi, um, hopefully you can hear me and see my screen. Looks great. Perfect. Hi, I'm Hussein. I'm a research scientist over at Georgia Tech. And I'll be uh, just giving a very quick overview on uh, Coral Hydro 2K. Uh, yeah, so um, the Coral Hydro 2K project, um, I think started in 2017 um, with the idea of um, using with the idea of building on what Oceans 2K did um, and instead of reconstructing temperature, uh, taking um, these coral delta 18 and coral strontium calcium records and using them to reconstruct uh, hydroclimate or hydrology um, in the tropical oceans over the last um, few centuries. Um, so this is our team. Um, we're, we're led by uh, Thomas Felice, uh, Narely Abram and Kim Cobb. I have somehow found myself in that leadership group. I don't know how. Um, and uh, our data liaison officer is Cal Hallie Kilborn and our ECR network representative is Jessica Hargreaves. So if you have questions, you can sort of reach out to any of us. If you're interested in joining, you can also reach out to any of us and we can sort of add you to our group Slack channel and Google drives and let you know when the meetings are. So yeah, um, as I said, our our motivation is was to really sort of um, build upon what Oceans 2K did so successfully. Um, Oceans 2K used uh, 57 published uh, coral records. Um, these were oxygen isotope records, surrounding calcium records, and um, extension rates, and they used that to reconstruct uh, temperature variability in each of the uh, tropical ocean basins, and at that time in 2014, um, there were only 10 paired strontium calcium and delta 18 records available that were included in Oceans 2K. And so um, the idea, um, I guess, was born uh, of trying to sort of use these paired records to um, try and reconstruct uh, hydrologic, uh, hydrologic variability um, in order to understand natural versus anthropogenic trends in global hydroclimate and understand how um, the marine hydrological cycle is related to the terrestrial hydrological cycle and you know just any other questions we could come up with. So um, so even though this group uh, started in 2017, I don't think um, actual work began until 2019, towards the end of 2019. And um, we then took a bit of a hiatus um, during the lockdown and ramped back up um, towards the end of this summer. So uh, we're still pretty new as far as a lot of pages 2K efforts go. Um, and if you're interested in joining, this would actually be the great time because we've done most of the annoying 
work of compiling the database. And so we're sort of now in the analysis phase and we're just ramping up on that. So this would be the best time uh, to join. So this is the uh, version point, uh, point 0.3 of the database. Um, so we've expanded um, from the original 57 records in Oceans 2K to now include 112 um, uh, coral delta 18 and serenium calcium records. Um, we, we're also including delta 18 seawater records if they are if they were included in the original publication. Uh, we have a variety of metadata included. We did our best to be compliant with um, the PACT standard that um, Julian, Emil J, and uh, Deborah Kider um, published um, based on a community survey, I want to say a year or two ago. Um, and the data is organized in tiers based on whether both delta 18 and serenium calcium are available for each coral. Um, whether or not the records cover uh, the 20th century and then the resolution of the records. Um, we also have tiers four and five, which are Delta 18O only records. And these, these are included uh, because there's still some hydrology information contained in those um, that we might be able to use. Uh, we're also currently adding a tier six and seven, and these are going to be strontium calcium only records. Um, which might be useful for um, our reconstruction. So as you can see, we have uh, pretty good uh, coverage across the tropical oceans. In terms of time, uh, because these are coral records, uh, most of our records um, don't go too far back in time. And so our reconstruction will um, ultimately be limited um, to just the last few centuries as opposed to several, uh, as opposed to the common era, like most, uh, most of the pages projects. So um, now that we have our database, we're kind of moving into understanding how uh, we can reconstruct hydrology using these paired records. And so there are two parallel efforts moving forward on this front. Um, the first is to understand the relationship between strontium calcium and temperature. Um, there are now 70 plus published slopes in the literature, and we're not sure why these inconsistencies exist. And, some of them may have um, may be related to the calibration methodology used, and so um, uh, one of the members of our our group, uh, Rachel Walter, will be presenting um, the results from the strontium calcium uh, to SST calibration work uh, at AGU. Um, another effort that is also underway is understanding the relationship between coral delta eighteen delta eighteen seawater and salinity. And um, this is, again, another source of uncertainty that stems from the fact that we don't have a lot of reliable salinity observations and we don't have a lot of delta 18 seawater measurements. And so if you happen to have delta 18 seawater data, we would be, we would be very, very happy um, to have it. So please reach out. We would love to hear from you. And then lastly, we have um, the reconstructions. Um, we're planning on two reconstructions. Uh, one will use the coral records only to reconstruct um, hydrology, uh, hydrology trends um, over recent centuries. That, that quite, hasn't quite spun up yet because it's waiting on, um, it's waiting on results from these, um, these other efforts. But we have also started um, uh, building our paleo data assimilation approach. Um, and this is work that's being spearheaded by Sarah Sanchez and uh, Feng Zhu. And the idea here is that we can take model, uh, model output, which has multiple different possible states, and we can anchor those uh, using our coral surrounding calcium and delta 18 records that are in the database and use that to narrow down um, the the possible range of climate variability that may have occurred. And um, so far, we've only done this with tier one records. There are about 20 records in tier one, and the results appear to be uh, quite promising. So over here, um, we have the correlation between our, our um, LMR, uh, our LMR and our instrumental SST, and you can see that they're 
um, really well correlated. Um, and then here we have another metric. Um, this is the coefficient of efficiency. Um, this works similar to correlation, except it, except it accounts for um, skewness and other um, other uh, properties in our data. And so it's a more reliable um, estimate of skill. And in this case, you can see again our our uh, data simulation approach um, seems to be working really well in the tropics. And so we're eager to push this forward um, and push all of our other efforts forward. So yeah, um, that is kind of where we're at. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions after this. And if you're interested in joining, uh, you can just shoot me an email. Um, that's my email address. Uh, you can sign up for the listserv. Um, if you do sign up for the list, sir, please use an official email address. And if you do, we'll see that and we'll reach out to you because we don't actually use the listserv because we do most of our communication on Slack. So we'll just reach out to you and send you an invite to our Slack channel. But yeah, uh, thank you. Great. Julian's got another question, which I'll note down and we'll come back to. Um, so yeah, George, Georgie, um, you're uh, listed to speak next. Thank you. Hi, you can see me, all right? Yes, thank you. Great, thanks. So, uh, my name is Georgie Foster. Um, I'm a postdoc at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, and so I've been part of the ISO2K project uh, in, a, in a minor way since 2015, but much more so since last year. Um, I personally got involved um, via my PhD advisor, John Tyler, who's also part of the team. So I'll just shoot quickly through what ICTK is, what we've done, what we're doing now, um, and then how you can get involved. Uh, so ICTK is a project within page, uh, phase three, um, and our goal is really to investigate hydroclimate variability via water isotope proxy records. Um, and so a major part of this has been the compilation of this global database of paleo water isotope proxy records uh, from all archives with very comprehensive metadata stored using a standardized vocabulary, um, which lets us do analyses across all archives listed there. Uh, so ISO2K was started back in 2015, so it's been going a while now uh, by Bronwyn Konecki who at that stage, I think was in the second year of her postdoc, um, and also Judd Patton. Um, and this was really sparked by this need to understand variability in past hydroclimate, which is something that water isotopes are ideal for uh, because they integrate information from all the various components of the water cycle. Uh, so ISO2K has quite a variable cast of about 30 people. Um, with another 20 or so who faded in and out over the years, it's quite common for people to pop in and contribute when they can and then disappear or reappear a few years later. And something that we're quite proud of at ICGK is that almost the entire project has been done remotely. So with regular telecons and mini retreats and online co-working sessions since 2015, uh, I need all that time, only one face-to-face -face meeting at the last page's OSM. So you can see we were quite well prepared for the weirdness of 2020. Uh, so just a few more details on who we are. Um, ICGK is slightly unusual amongst the pages working groups in that we have experts from every archive type um, who coordinated the metadata collation and data quality control, as well as contributing to the manuscripts. Uh, ICGK has come from many countries, which makes coordinating the telecons an absolute joy. Uh, and there are lots of early to mid career researchers. Um, as you can see from our picture, we're a very serious bunch. Uh, this photo was taken at our one face to face meeting in Zaragoza, where a lot of people who've been working together for a while already met for the first time. And so at this age, I was in the third year of my PhD. Um, so well and truly an early career researcher. And yeah, this common thread in ICGK is that there are a lot of people who've come and gone, and there have also been a lot of people who've joined over the past few years um, with the project already well underway. Um, so I'll just give you a quick rundown on what we've achieved in the past five years, and then go through what is still to be done, where you can help. Uh, so of course, we've been thinking about the um, 
science questions that the database can help to address since ISDK's inception. Uh, but the first few years of the project really focused on gathering these paleo water isotope records and their metadata and entering these into the database. Um, so ISOGK records are formatted as lipid files, which is a standardized format that keeps all the data and metadata in nice, neat machine readable files. Um, and then over the past two years or so, the effort has shifted slightly to finalizing the database, uh, doing final quality control checks, and then writing up the data descriptor manuscript to accompany the published database. Uh, and this came out just a few months ago. Uh, which was very exciting after so many years of work. Um, and there's a link to the paper in the bottom left. Um, and the paper tells you where you can get the actual data. Um, and so right now we're working on the first global synthesis paper. Uh, so the first results and interpretations from the database. Uh, and this is getting pretty close to submission. Um, and I think also Sam Stevenson is talking about some of these results at AGU too. Uh, so there is a lot still to be done, uh, including a plan for the maintenance of the database and future updates, uh, as well as entering new data sets as they're published. You, of course, can contribute your own data. Um, and of course, now that we have this wonderful resource, there's huge potential for helping with any science questions that you might have about the water cycle and many other things. Uh, and, and somewhere uh, on the horizon, I've put the text size here to scale with my enthusiasm for this project, uh, but it's also maybe doing a bit more with age models. Um, the lipid format is really powerful in that it stores chronology metadata um, as well as the raw data. And this is something you might think about for future ISOGK versions. Um, if a record was published with raw chronology data, like the actual radiometric age determinations, this is already in the database. So it's maybe a bit more to be done with that. Uh, and so finally, this is the part maybe you've been waiting for, which is how can you get involved in ICTK? Um, it's very straightforward. We have a mailing list that you can join from the pages website. Um, and every month or so we have a telecom that is announced via that mailing list. So you can show up and introduce yourself. We're a very friendly group. Um, and this is where you can meet other people who are interested in using the database for various purposes. Uh, you can, of course, go straight to the database and we encourage you to do this. Uh, there are serializations in Python, MATLAB and R. Um, and the database description paper uh, comes with example code of how to use the database in each of these. Um, and even better if you do both of those things, so you can get in and try some analysis in the database and then come along to a telecon and tell us how you went. So that's an extremely quick rundown of ICGK. Um, I will stop there, uh, but yes, I'll be happy to take any questions after this. Great, Georgie, that's terrific. All right, well, um, well I, did, I did note you're working remotely. Yes, I think that's a real characteristic of 2K. Um, Liz, are you able to jump on in? I thought I did see Liz here. Hello, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. <laughs> sorry about that, I was just talking to myself and realised I was still on mute. And I'll just share my screen with you. Good stuff. Okay. Hopefully you can see that coming up. It's a bit slow. Good full screen. Yep, it's coming up. Okay, let me just get back to that. Terrific. Okay, brilliant. Um, okay, so for those who don't know me, um, my name's Liz Thomas, um, and I have been leading the Clivash 2K working group for the last few years. Um, so I've been involved with Pages for um, a little while, um, I sort of got involved as part of the regional 2K groups, as part of the Antarctica 2K, 2K um, working group, um, where I sort of stepped up and took the lead on one of the data compilations for the um, Antarctic snow accumulation records. Um, and then it was at the Zaragoza pages meeting that um, I sort of drummed up some support for keeping this um, 
keeping the momentum that we built up from the Antarctic um, 2K project and expanding it slightly. So the idea of Clivash that's sort of different from the previous regional groups is that we're interested in not just what's happening in Antarctica, but actually what's happening across the whole of the Southern Hemisphere. And particularly, it's the interactions between um, what's going on in the Southern Ocean, Antarctica, and looking at the drivers of variability. So looking at modes of variability, so the Southern Annular Mode, um, the influence of sort of tropical teleconnections, ENSO, and then really sort of expanding a bit beyond what we have achieved so far, which is looking at the um, snow accumulation and surface temperature to incorporate as many of the other proxies as we can. So the working group that we have at the moment, as has sort of been mentioned previously, that the We've got a lot of people signed up on the mailing list, I think 150, but of that there's probably about 25 to 30 that are that are active members. And in fact, I probably need to refresh some of the, the, um, the working group because it, it very much changes depending on, on what we're really looking at. Um, and sometimes we need to reflect that. Um, but essentially we bring together a range of different archives. So the ice cores, um, marine sediment records, lake sediment records, um, and peak cores. And we're trying to engage not just the, the paleo people that are actually working on the data collection, but actually working really closely with the um, climate modelers and the observation list as well. So bringing together the experts on the instrumental data. Um, and we've been really successful actually in producing some really interesting model data um, synthesis and into comparisons. So um, we've been quite active, I think, in, in how we've been meeting. We had um, a workshop uh, back in 2018 and that was really well attended and I just kind of put these things up here to show it really is quite a young group so actually of those 40 particip participants that we had back in 2018 I, I went back through the numbers and 23 of those um, identified themselves as early career and of those there was 14 students um, and certainly in everything that we've been doing all of the um, meetings working groups um, papers has actually had a very strong early career influence. So one of the outcomes from the, um, the workshop was a special issue and we put together nine papers and of those nine papers, actually six of them were um, first authors were actually PhD students or early postdocs. So I think that's kind of demonstrates that we're quite engaged with more so with the younger community and that might explain why we've actually been able to stay quite active. Um, so some of the work that we've been doing is, um, as I've mentioned, we've had some successful data model into comparison. There's been quite a few papers out. Um, and then we've also worked on a number of review articles. And one of them that I'm just showing here is um, a review about, um, oh, sorry, just flipped through a bit too quickly there, is a review which was looking at the sea ice proxies that we can collect from ice cores and from marine records. Um, and this is quite an interesting study. It took a lot of effort and lots of people from different um, backgrounds kind of coming together to see what data was available. Um, and as well as compiling a, a huge database, we've actually sort of highlighted some of the issues um, surrounding the amount of data that's actually available and the um, spatial variability. So sort of leading on from that, um, we had a meeting back in August where we initiated a new data call. Um, because we were aware as a community that there's an awful lot more data, certainly from the ice cores, but also from potential other archives um, that may tell us something about um, sea ice. So we had a meeting in August and the team came up with the idea that we should actually start collecting all available sodium data from ice cores. Um, and on the map here, we've sort of shown some of the data that is published and in the purple dots. And then we're increasing that. We can see some of the orange dots of the unpublished data that's already been submitted, um, but we've got a lot more data coming in. So this is kind of the option really for saying about how to get involved. So this is quite an active um, project that we have at the moment. We have a deadline of the 1st of December for submitting data, but I mean, we're obviously gonna be a little bit flexible in that, I suspect. But so this is a call for anybody who's interested in this subject to consider submitting the data. Um, but I'm also aware that potentially for early career researchers, maybe they don't have so much data or they're not in a position to submit, but we're also sort of calling for people to get involved and engaged in the um, actual data interpretation, 
helping us to, um, to work on the data once we've got it and sort of join the writing team as well. Um, some of the other things I just wanted to put up here is, you know, this is a good opportunity. We've, we're going to be collecting lots of new data and it's a good opportunity for looking at new methods. Um, we're exploring options with um, some students particularly interested in machine learning and artificial intelligence. So, you know, there's other things that I think some of the other working groups, especially within pages, could really um, help us here as well, different methods of um, understanding climate variability. And I'm just going to leave the last thing up here for, you know, kind of um, getting involved and it's important that you don't wait to be asked to take the lead so I certainly stepped up to it without asking um, and I think that's the way that you can you can get involved is just if you've got a good idea or you're enthusiastic and you want to do something then just get in touch and and start doing it okay great thanks Liz that's terrific um We'll move on to Oliver. Um, do you, you were going to run a video. I'll, I'll let you see yep. how you go there. Can't quite hear you, Oliver. No. I think I can hear you really faintly. Does Can anyone else? Yes, that's the same for me. Same for you, that's yep. Let's try what I planned. Oh, you're just fraction louder. That's good. <laughs> um, I think um, I think we need to invent some Zoom waiting music and thinking music. All right, I can see your video so, there. All right. Now some words on Paleolink. Our understanding of past environmental changes mostly rests on two sources of information. They are local or regional reconstructions from EG tree rings, like this one, this tree section illustration. And they are coarse resolution, mostly global climate models, like this example here. And it is hard to link, to combine, to connect both sources of information. Paleolink now wants to improve our ability to link the global data with the local to regional data um, via statistical and dynamical downscaling approaches. Downs dynamical downscaling refers to regional climate simulations like illustrated by this example here. The project has some specific objectives. For example, it wants to quantify the added value that can be achieved with regional model simulations in paleoclimatology. It wants to compare the statistical and the dynamical approaches. And it is also interested in applying proxy forward models. Paleolink has also a listserv. The link is given there, but you also find that on the past global changes homepage. And there was a publication by Paleolink last year on the perspectives of regional modeling in paleoclimatology. And well, last year, 20 months ago, there was a face-to-face -face workshop in Murcia in Spain that set off a number of initiatives. These aimed at addressing the project's core question. So what do we gain by using regional climate simulations? And one wanted to discuss the added value, but also wanted to provide a case study on comparing global regional simulations and historical reconstructions for the Iberian Peninsula with a focus on hydrology and atmospheric circulation. Furthermore, there was a working group that wanted to address changes in the regional European seas. That is, for example, the Baltic Sea or the North Sea or the Mediterranean Sea, sea um, and wanted to do so from a modeling and a paleo data perspective, or rather bringing these two perspectives together. The project and the initiatives all 
were slowed down, not only by COVID, but also by COVID. And there were other reasons, unfortunately. So if anyone wanted to contribute to the initiatives or to the project's goals, I'm pretty sure Paleolink would be very welcoming to your support. Thanks. Thanks, Oliver. Thanks very much. That's great. Um, okay, well, everyone's been really on time. So we do have a few minutes for some questions. Um, I'll just start off by going through some that popped up in the chat window. So a couple from um, Julian Milgier um, asking, I'm pretty sure it was to Multicron, um, that beautiful data set uh, time series that, that you guys had reconstructed, I think it was for the North Atlantic. And um, the question was, is there is that data available and is that is there more of that data available? Um, I think the question popped up when Karen was talking. I think it was, uh, if it was the last slide, I think this is the Carlin Algae sea ice reconstruction by Jochen Halfer. Yep, great. Yeah, and it's, that's it's published. Fantastic. And so we're working excellent. on um, more from Svalbard, amongst other things, and also from Greenland and Arctic Canada. Fantastic. Very, yeah, very impressive records. Uh, and then uh, Julian also had a question for Coral Hydro 2K, just asking um, what was your data management plan and are you using the Lipid format? Uh, we're not using the Lipid format at the moment, but hopefully we will be. And um, we'll have the data set available in different serializations. It's currently only in MATLAB. So uh, yeah. we're working on it. <laughs> Watch this space. Uh, and then I think there was another question from Kristen Braun about um, where the special issue was published. And um, Sarah quickly put a link into the chat window. Uh, it was published, uh, This sorry, this was the Cluvash uh, special issue. It was published in Climate of the Past. Sorry, that, my mistake, it was geosciences. Oh, geosciences, <laughs> the second sorry. One. Okay, it was in geosciences. So, so the link is there. Um, yeah, does anyone have any other questions or comments or, or anything else that they want to contribute? Um, we're, you know, we're, we're really pleased to have um, been able to speak to everyone and I'm really grateful to everyone from the working groups for, for putting something together and giving us such a lovely overview, especially a little bit of short notice. So i um, very grateful for that. So any questions from anyone else? No, we definitely need thinking music, right? Um, all right. Well, look, um, hopefully you've got a good overview. Um, do If you didn't catch any of the email addresses for projects you want to get involved in, um, go and have a look at the 2K um, website and um, you'll find all the links to all the different people and um, get involved. And yeah, I hope this has sort of demystified um, the 2K network a little bit for you as well. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's been an amazing program for a number of people and, and a few of you commented on people popping in and popping out and doing their little bit. And I think that's just such a wonderful part of it. And uh, never mind that here in Australia, we either end up early in the morning or late at night. That's okay because the, the science is so interesting and, and the community is so fun to work with. It's a really terrifically collaborative. Um, Sarah, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I just want to say thank you so much, especially to Helen. Um, and as we wrote in the chat, um, the video, the recording of this will be available on the Early Career Network YouTube channel. Um, and as Stella pointed out, um, who's on the, the leadership committee of the Early Career Network, um, that will be communicated um, via an email to their listserv. So please join that listserv if, um, if you're not already on it. And thank you all for attending. Great. And, and Julian's just popped in with one other comment. Um, yeah, do you want to come on and just, um, just have, have a few words? I might add a comment about linkages to DAPs. And there's a link in the link to there. 
Sure, I'm happy. I just wanted to point out that since the Pages 2K project started, which was, <laughs> as Sarah reminds us, quite a few years ago now, uh, there have been some very exciting developments, in particular on the mythological front. And so data assimilation is sort of rising as a very exciting way to integrate many sources of observations that previously couldn't really be processed. There's obviously still a lot of science that needs to be done, but uh, to me, it's very exciting that with uh, development of more proxy system models, for example, we can start really ingesting more and more of these data sets into these large scale reconstructions, which used to be pretty much only tree rings. And now we can st start thinking about incorporating more ocean based observations, for instance. So if any of you are interested in that, I would encourage you to also participate in the APS and, and explore some of these intersections, because I think it's very relevant. Terrific. Thank you for that addition. Um, yeah, okay. So there's a few comments popping up. If anyone else wants to add anything, please go ahead. Um, I'm mindful that we've been going for an hour and probably some people need to go to bed. Some people need to get on with their day. Some people are in the middle of their day and probably have the next meeting to get to. Um, so uh, yeah, we're here to answer questions for another couple of minutes. Otherwise, thank you everyone for participating.